I've spoken of a thousand points of light, of all the community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for the appearance among Remembering us. Remembering the life of George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st President of the United States. Lawmakers and world leaders pay their final respects. Also, this past week, the G20 summit BOA was in Buenos Aires as the world's leading countries gathered in Argentina to solve global economic problems. But did they succeed? Welcome to Plugged In, I'm Greta Van Susteren, and much happened this week. The G20 in Argentina, and we traveled there, but late last Friday brought Americans very sad news. The death at the age of 94 of the 41st President of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush. We will bring you some of the tributes coming in from world leaders, politicians, and lawmakers, and we will also bring you my exclusive interview with U.S. President Donald Trump in Argentina. His thoughts on the G20, on China, Russia, and our trading partners. At the G20, we also sat down with Singapore's finance minister to talk about his hopes for the global economy. And we will bring you analysis from our VOA correspondents from around the world. We're on Facebook at Voice of America, and we'd love to hear your comments and questions. But first, an update. A state funeral here in Washington, D.C., at the U.S. Capitol and at Washington's National Cathedral to honor former U.S. President George H.W. Bush. He died Friday at his home in Texas, just seven months after his wife of 73 years died. President Bush was 94. American lawmakers and the Bush family paid tribute to the president in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. VOA's Brian Patton filed this report on how some are remembering the life of an influential and much-loved American president, a man who dedicated his life to making his country a kinder, gentler nation. On Monday at the Texas National Air Base, cannons fired in salute while a military honor guard escorted the body of former U.S. President George H.W. Bush for his last flight to the nation's capital. His son, former President George W. Bush, along with family and friends, were by his side. During the arrival ceremony at the Capitol Rotunda, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence spoke of the former president's lifetime of service to the country. His example will always inspire, and his lifetime of service will be enshrined in the hearts of the American people forever. The U.S. Naval Academy Glee Club sang America the Beautiful for the late president, who served as a naval fighter pilot during World War II and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for heroism after his squadron was shot down by Japanese forces. Before winning the presidency in 1989, Bush served as ambassador Report. to the United Nations, as U.S. envoy to China, director of the CIA, and a twice-elected congressman before he became running mate and vice president to fellow Republican President Ronald Reagan. He was a patriot. He demonstrated that in war. He demonstrated that in peace. Bush presided over the peaceful end of the Cold War after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and helped negotiate the reunification of Germany. He is the father or one of the fathers of the German unification and we will never forget that. He knew foreign policy, he understood it, he managed the end of the Cold War peacefully, it ended with a whimper, not a bang. After the Iraqi forces of Saddam Hussein invaded neighboring Kuwait, President Bush organized an international military coalition to liberate the oil-rich U.S. ally. Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. The U.S.-led Operation Desert Storm successfully pushed Iraqi forces out of Kuwait, but Bush stopped short of removing Hussein from power, a move that many criticized at the time. More than a decade later, his son, former President George W. Bush, launched a full-scale invasion of Iraq that effectively removed the Iraqi dictator. Despite his military success, the elder Bush's popularity ultimately declined due to a recession. Read he also lost some support lips. within his own party after breaking a campaign promise not to raise taxes. He lost his re-election bid in 1992 to President Bill Clinton. Upon leaving office, he left a note to his successor, which many say spoke volumes of his character. The letter read, your success is now our country's success. I am rooting hard for you. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. 
After a second service at the National Cathedral, the former president returns home to Texas, where he will be buried at the Bush Presidential Library in College Station, Texas. The other big story this week was in Argentina. President Donald Trump took his America First foreign policy there for a major gathering of world leaders. VOA's Bill Gallo reports in Buenos Aires the multilateral summit that was perhaps most notable for its one-on-one -on -one interactions. Despite a growing wave of global nationalism, there was an attempt at international cooperation at the G20 summit in Argentina. Controversial issues like immigration and trade were largely avoided here. On climate change, the U.S. simply agreed to disagree with everyone else. One obvious complicating factor here was the role played by U.S. President Donald Trump, whose outspoken nationalism and America-first approach to the world often downplay the role of international institutions like the G20. In an interview with VOA's Spanish service, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. remains committed to international cooperation. To create prosperity uh, for every citizen of the world, uh, to develop uh, rules that permit that to happen. They're, these are common themes. We'll sometimes argue about how best to achieve them, um, but everyone's headed towards the same set of objectives. But with the world's most powerful nation openly calling for its interests to take precedence, some smaller countries are concerned about a breakdown in international institutions. That's, that's not good for us because we are small and we need rules in order to be able to perform better. If we are left to power politics, uh, only then, I mean, we are on the losing side. Amid the disagreements, the most notable events were the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman used the G20 to rehabilitate his image after the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping used it to reduce U.S.-China trade frictions. But Trump canceled a highly anticipated meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, citing Moscow's aggression against Ukraine. In the end, a forum meant to foster international unity may be more notable for its disunity. Bill Gallo, VOA News, at the G20 Summit in Buenos Aires. Fresh off the heels of signing the revamped version of the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico's outgoing president Enrique Peña Nieto and Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, President Donald Trump spoke to VOA about trade agreements, tariffs, the global economy and domestic topics impacting the United States and the world. Here's part of my interview with the president. Mr. President, we're here in Argentina and the United States, Canada and Mexico has signed a new trade agreement updating right. NAFTA. That's right. Um, now, um, one of the parts of it has to do with auto workers, auto parts. Is that in any way going to specifically address one of the issues the United States has with GM closing, pl closing plants and 14,000 right. losing jobs? Well, it is, and it's not only that. It's going to keep auto companies from moving. One of the things I really wanted is plants and auto companies and just general, I mean, jobs, factories. I don't want them leaving the United States. That was very important to me. And we're not leaving the United States. So I think one of the strongest elements of the new, it's, you know, the... I call it with the, the USMCA, uh, one of the really important things is you won't see companies leaving once that gets signed. We have to get it through Congress. And if it gets through, uh, which I think it will, that'll be great. And if it doesn't, we're very happy the way it is now. As you call out China as, as one of the countries you say is ripping off the United States, China's global footprint is expanding. They're all over North Africa. They're building a huge port in Pakistan. Uh, they have great deals, investment deals in Panama and Latin America, sort of coming very close to the United States geographically. Um, do you trust the strategic goals of China? Or are you a little bit worried? Well, I think they're going to have less money than they have right now because the deal that I'm making, if you look at, uh, we have $250 billion right now at 25 percent. That means we're going to be taking in billions and billions of dollars, plus I can double that up and then I can double it again. And uh, they could never do what they did in the past with other presidents because, and you see what's happening. I mean, China is, I don't want to do this, but they are not doing very well now compared to what they were doing. And uh, again, I think that we are doing well. But as a national security point, you know, with their investment in Latin America and all over the world, it does seem that they are they are making a bigger footprint around the world. I know, but they have a debt problem and they have to pay for that debt. It's a tremendous amount of money that they're spending. Uh, do I like it? Probably not. But I also know it's very expensive for them and a lot of those places aren't going to work out. 
You were going to, or at least you had considered meeting with um, President Putin, and you've declined to. Um, had you met with him, what was going to be on your agenda with the president? Well, I just said that, you know, frankly, in light of what happened with Ukraine, with the, with the ships and the sailors, it just wouldn't be the right time. But I will meet with him. I think we have a very good relationship, and I think we're going to have a very good relationship with Russia and China and everyone else. I mean, I think it's important. So I'll meet with him at the appropriate time. What do you think his and his he's thinking about doing with Ukraine? Why, why did why did he seize the sailors and the vessels? I can't vessels? read his mind, and nobody can. And he knows what he wants to do, but we can't allow certain things to happen. And uh, you know, it happened, and I just I just can't be a part of it. All right. Um, one of the issues of a global economy is climate change. Um, that's a discussion here. Uh, what's your position on climate change and how it has an effect on the economy worldwide? Yeah, very simple. I want the cleanest air and the cleanest water on the planet. I want crystal clean water, and that's what we have. Uh, we've been doing very well with respect to the environment, and that's what I want. But I'm not going to put the country out of business trying to maintain certain standards that probably don't matter. When you look at China and when you look at other countries where they have very, you know, foul air, they have not good air, that comes over to the United States. You know, people don't want to talk about it, but it comes over. So we're going to be clean, but they're not. And it costs a lot of money. Well, the fact is, we are absolutely clean, but we're not going to spend trillions of dollars and make it good for others, but not make it good for... You know, I have a very simple policy. It's called America First. At the same time, we're going to be a great neighbor to the world, but we have to treat ourselves fairly. So that's the way it is. Are you going to mention President Xi about climate change? We'll talk about it. We're talking about a lot of things. Look, the big thing we're talking about is trade. That's what people want to hear. And, uh, you know, he's got to do something with his climate. His climate's a little bit tough, but, uh, and I'm sure he will. I think he's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a good man, but, you know, we have a little bit of a dispute. And again, uh, our country has been taken advantage of for many years, and that's just not going to happen anymore. All right, now the, our domestic economy. Um, next week, there's a vote possibly on a government shutdown. Um, first of all, do you think there is going to be a U.S. government shutdown, and does that have any sort of global economic impact? Well, I can't tell you if there's going to be a shutdown because nobody knows, but I will tell you we're going to have border security. We're going to have a lot of border security. You saw what we did with the all of the caravans coming up, and now they're starting to head out. They're starting to go back. But we are going to have security. We're not going to let people come into our country illegally. We're going to have people come in on merit. We need people. You know, we have the lowest unemployment rate we've had in 51 years. We need people in this country. We have companies moving in. In fact, uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan just told me they're moving two big car companies. They're going to be opening up two massive plants. You know, you don't hear that often. But a lot of that is happening. You hear about a General Motors, and I don't know what happened with General Motors, but the trend is exactly the opposite. And I will say this, uh, our economy has never done better. We're doing unbelievable numbers. You see that. And a lot of good things are happening. $5 billion is what you want for the wall, this go-around. Um, so far, Congress is saying that it won't. So what happens? We'll have to see what happens. Are you I, willing to negotiate? Is it well, negotiable I, look, for you? I, look, I'll just tell you this. We're going to have border security. And if we're not going to have border security, uh, some very tough things are going to happen. But we're going to have border security. We can't have people pouring into our country like they have over the last 10 years. And you see what's happening when you have MS-13 and these gang members. And look at the caravan. Now they have over 650 people that are absolutely stone-cold criminals. I don't want them in our country. I'm not going to have it. You don't have borders. You don't have a country, Greta. And I'm not going to have it. All right. Uh, one last question, and I'll give you a chance to, to, to educate there, or at least talk about the American media. Um, what is it the U.S. media collectively doesn't understand about the economy? When you, when you look at things, you hear our reporting. Any thoughts about our reporting? Well, I think they understand the economy. They know how well we're doing. They just don't like to say it because that's good for me. So they don't want to say it. You know, look, I call it fake news. I don't say the media. I say you have so much uh, false reporting. But we have a phenomenal economy. They know that. Look, we have the best unemployment numbers as a group that we've ever had. You look at African-American unemployment and Asian and uh, Hispanic-American. You look at all of it, they're the best numbers in history. The best, I mean, these are historic lows. So the media knows how well we're doing. They tend not to want to write it. So you like discussing the economy of these world leaders? I do. I mean, we have the best economy in the world. Actually, every leader came up to me virtually. And they said, congratulations on the great economy. 
Mr. President, nice to see you. Thank you, Greta. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice. Thank you very much. <laughs>
to try and reach some agreement that the two big two biggest economies in the world will come together and try and resolve this because the rest of us uh, the rest of the world is looking with great anticipation and great uh, uh, anxiety of on this how this issue is going to be resolved but i hope that uh, if we set the right tone for the meeting and that there is a commitment on both sides to seek win-win solutions then the meetings that they are going to have and the agreement that they can have to start working on it in a very systematic and rational way will be very helpful. President Trump seems to have a very strong view on climate change. Mm -hmm. um, he has said things to suggest that he doesn't think there is climate change. You mm -hmm. mentioned climate change a moment ago. Um, how important is climate change as an issue here at the G20? And that's the first question. Second is, is how do you get the United States to look at that? For an island state like us, climate change is something that we take very seriously because it is a risk that we cannot afford to ignore. And therefore, we need to look at the scientific evidence. We need to monitor the uh, uh, progress of our work. I have announced that we will impose a carbon tax starting from next year because we think that we must all do our part to mitigate it to the best of our ability and that we need to work together across the world in order to uh, tackle this very major challenge. So how do you get big nations that are contributors to the issue, perhaps uh -huh. China, United States, India, some of these other these big countries who are contributing to the issue, um, how do you get them to have the same level of interest as an island nation such as your own? Well, um, uh, first I, I hope that the scientists around the world are working together on this in order to present credible scientific evidence of these uh, changes that we are seeing. And uh, two, that we use global uh, forum, whether it's G20 or whether it is the uh, Climate Change Committee, to look at the evidence of this and look at how we can all uh, cooperate on, on this aspect of, of the work. Because it is a critical challenge, not just uh, for one or two countries, but across the whole world. When you step back and look at the globe and you see what chi the Chinese economy, China is mm -hmm. reaching all over the world. It's, got a, um, it's reaching into North Africa, mm -hmm. to Pakistan, down into a port, uh, that, uh, a new port that they're building. Mm -hmm. They've got, they're, just, they're moving all over the planet and they're active in the China, in the South Sea. Uh, what's your sort of thoughts about China's role in the world economy right now? Where's it headed? Well, um, I, I think if China can help to uh, develop these various economies well, you know, to provide some inputs. Just like in the very early years, uh, I think many countries benefited from help from the, from the US. And the Marshall Plan is just one example of it. But at the same time, the uh, US corporate investments around the world has been very important in raising the economic potential of many countries. Singapore is, has been a big beneficiary of U.S. corporate investments. And even till today, we have many large U.S. companies that have their operations in Singapore, whether it is high-tech companies like HP or Google, or Amazon, uh, or uh, banks and like Citi and a whole range of financial institutions. And we do believe that uh, that sort of uh, specialization and that sort of quality of companies that we are able to attract help us help to lift our potential and help to uh, lift the potential of our workers. So in the same way, if it is, uh, if it, if it is a system that is properly structured, that looks at proper returns on investments, and which can work together with the government to raise the you know, the incomes of our people. It can be very beneficial to people around the world. Mr. Uh, Finance yeah. Minister, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Buenos Aires G20 Summit marks the 13th meeting of the group of 20 countries. Combined, these countries account for 85% of the world's gross domestic product and 75% of the world's trade. 
It is also the first G20 summit ever to be held in a South American country. For Argentine President Macri, it was an opportunity to bring South American perspectives to a global forum, and it was also an opportunity for the thousands of delegates and visitors who gathered in the country's capital city a chance to experience old world Europe with a twist of tango and also some great food. VOA producer Brian Allen traveled with us to Argentina. Here is his take on the charms and some of the flavor, flavor of the vibrant city called Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is Argentina's capital and largest city. Located on the shores of the Rio de la Plata, the greater Buenos Aires area is home to almost 14 million people. The architecture is distinctly European, but with a Latin American twist, and the city is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. Porteños, as people from Buenos Aires are called, are as passionate about their city as they are the local football teams. Important landmarks include El Obelisco, which is in the middle of Avenida Nueve de Julio, the widest street in the world. The Plaza de Mayo sits in front of the Casa Rosada, which is the executive mansion and office of the president of Argentina. The Recoleta Cemetery is one of the most beautiful in the world. Here you can find the tombs of past presidents and other important figures from Argentine history. <laughs> Buenos Aires is perhaps best known for the tango, a romantic and passionate dance style that combines influences from many other cultures from across the world and reflects Argentina's diverse immigrant populations. The city is a melting pot of different cultures, as eclectic as the colors of the famous Boca neighborhood. The majority of immigrants to Argentina came from Italy and Spain, but the country also saw large numbers come from Germany, France, Great Britain, Ukraine, and Russia, among many others. Argentina is also known for its beef, which has a reputation for being the best in the world. You can find a wide variety of cuts of meat here, cooked on small grills on street corners, or elaborate barishas in fancy restaurants. Argentine wine is also world-renowned. The 2018 G20 Summit in Buenos Aires was the first ever held in South America. Along with the 2018 Summer Youth Olympics and a joint bid with Uruguay and Paraguay for the 2030 World Cup, the G20 Summit turned the world's attention to this corner of the globe. The beauty of Buenos Aires showed why it was worth the trip. Brian Allen, VOA News, Buenos Aires. And before we go, some final thoughts on a story that may have slipped under the radar. I recently traveled to Saipan, a small island chain, part of the U.S. Commonwealth, located in the northern Mariana Islands. I traveled in a cargo plane belonging to an NGO, Samaritan's Purse. They were responding to Saipan and Tinian after a superstorm, Typhoon U2, devastated the two islands. This megastorm slammed both islands with 200 mile an hour winds, causing extensive damage to the island's infrastructure and its people. Based out of North Carolina, Samaritan's Purse used its own DC-8 to successfully transport more than 2,000 electric generators to the islands, along with much needed medical aid, solar powered lights, water filtration units, and some 30 tons of more than 780 rolls of heavy duty plastic tarps that will be used to temporarily help house displaced survivors. Among those displaced were the residents of Saipan's only zoo. Sadly, many of the animals died during the superstorm, and a few were told are in need of help, including a Siberian tiger, and my favorite, a proud African lion named Lambert. Samaritan's Purse is bringing those two big cats back to the United States to a big cat sanctuary where they will be taken care of. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice of America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.